Yora Koto Katoa, and welcome to um, this morning's CEO Forum on the new economy, resilience and regeneration. Uh, delighted um, that so many uh, can join this morning. We've reached capacity on our Zoom webinar of uh, 500, so we're really delighted with that. And we've also, we're also streaming live on Facebook, um, which shows a huge interest in this subject. You know, how should we recover from this COVID disruption? Um, so uh, introduction from, from me, my name's Phil Jones. I'm part of the uh, projects and advisory team at uh, SBN and I lead our climate work. Just wanted to start by kind of acknowledging um, all the business people out there, many of you um, who are listening today in terms of the tough times that you're going through. Our membership covers all sectors and sizes and we've really appreciate the extreme difficulties being encountered by many of them and obviously the tens of thousands of other businesses out there. Um, hopefully we're close to a loosening of restrictions in the next few weeks. The original theme of this forum was going to be climate action, our own new, a new climate action 2025 program that is progressing well um, and we're, you know, obviously remains as important as ever. Um, we'll be formally launching that in a couple of weeks. Um, but we're delighted today just to uh, say that we've had our first foundation partners um, sign up for the program, ICA and also Waka Kotahi uh, New Zealand Transport Agency. So that's really exciting and, and we'll um, let you know more about that in future days and weeks. So back to this morning, um, I, I know many of us will have read opinion pieces on, on how we should um, kind of plan our post COVID recovery and where we should invest. So the key theme emerging really is how do we use this opportunity actually to invest in things that are gonna address some of our systemic challenges we face the climate crisis, cleaning up our waterways, making our society less uh, un unequal. Um, just to, you know, just a few of those examples of the challenges we face. So it's within that context, um, we welcome our speakers today to give their views and opinions on, on this time and this opportunity. Um, we'll be starting with the Honourable James Shaw, delighted that James can join us um, online this morning, um, and then follow with Rachel Brown, Mike Bennett, and Kirsten Corson, I'll give an introduction to them um, before they speak. We'll then have a panel Q&A involving Rachel, Mike and Kirsten, um, so we'll um, let you know more about how you can engage in that uh, question and answer session um, uh, before Rachel speaks. Aiming to wrap up at 11, we will have a, a short break for our own essential services around about 10 a.m. just to give everybody a chance to get up and have a walk and um, make a cup of tea or whatever. Just to say throughout the day, throughout the morning, we'll be noting down comments and, and ideas will be uh, building on our ideas that we already have at SBN in terms of what our priorities should be. And we wanna um, you know, note down yours and record uh, and provide those to the minister and others after the event. Okay, so without further ado, I'll pass over to Minister Shaw, um, who will say a few words and then we'll have a, a, a Q and A based on some of the questions that were provided um, before the event. Minister. Well, kia ora koutou, um, and Phil, thank you for the introduction. Look, I just, I wanna just echo uh, some of what Phil said in his opening remarks, which is um, that I, I do wanna acknowledge that this is an incredibly difficult time for many of you, if not all of you. Uh, and um, in many ways, we know that actually, um, for business, the hard part is yet to come. It's going to take us quite a long time to uh, to rebuild, even if we're successful in uh, eliminating the virus from within within New Zealand. So, uh, I do uh, very much appreciate that, and and also that you're taking the time to uh, to join us here, because I know that for uh, most business leaders, your attention uh, will be on getting the business through uh, this, um, this current crisis. And that is entirely appropriate. Um, so, so thank you for all of the work that you're doing uh, to, to do that. And um, thank you also for keeping one eye on the long term uh, as well as on the short term. 
Um, the government's approach, uh, we've sort of got about, we, you know, when it comes to the economics of, of all of this, um, three time horizons that we're uh, trying to operate in simultaneously. So one is the very immediate, um, the kind of the next 24 to 48 hours, um, and that is the response to the crisis and cushioning the blow. Um, and that's a sort of a rolling time period that uh, could take sort of anywhere from now up to, I guess, six months or so until the medical crisis is um, behind us. The, the second time horizon um, is really about sort of um, positioning uh, for the recovery. And a lot of that, frankly, will be around um, employment uh, because we know that we will see um, significant numbers of people become unemployed as a result of uh, uh, the changes in the economy. Um, and then the third time horizon is more the long-term, um, you know, kind of revitalizing of, of the economy and so on. And all three of those time horizons need to talk to each other, obviously. Um, I think New Zealand has, in the past, uh, when, we, when we have some kind of economic crisis, which comes along about every 10 years on average, um, you know, we often make decisions in the short term that preclude our options uh, over the long term. And um, as Minister for Climate Change, uh, I know that we, we actually cannot afford to do that one more time um, because we know that our time horizon for reducing emissions is actually about 10, you know, the most dramatic work has to happen in the coming 10 years. And if you look at our previous experience, you know, if you go back 10 years ago to the GFC and the Christchurch earthquake, 10 years before that, um, we had uh, SARS um, and the, um, the dot-com bubble bursting in 2001. Uh, people just want things to go back to the way they were before, which is an entirely understandable human reaction. Um, and so generally the government response is to, is to try and do that, to restore things to the way that they uh, were before. And <clears throat> what that has done is it sort of locked us into uh, the kind of high emission pathway that we've been on for about 30 years now. Um, and so what we need to do this time um, is to think of it differently about how we um, resuscitate the economy and, and rebuild businesses and livelihoods and incomes uh, for the next 10 years. So um, that's where a lot of my time and attention is on. I've got other colleagues, obviously, who are operating in other parts of those three time horizons. Um, the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance, uh, you know, obviously dealing across all three of them, but with particular attention, uh, like you, on the very immediate threat that's, uh, that's in front of us. Um, but that isn't to say that those other time horizons aren't equally important and that we don't need to be doing that work as well. Um, I think... Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased that um, SBN is continuing to uh, roll out its program and the 2025 um, uh, uh, program um, that uh, is being launched over the next few weeks, I think is really important, um, particularly because I think a lot of the attention around emissions reduction uh, has been on the large uh, business end of town. Um, that's appropriate uh, and, and good. Um, but I know in my conversations with the Climate Leaders Coalition chief executives, a lot of them have been saying um, over uh, recent months that they know that they can't deliver their commitments without all of their suppliers and supply chains um, also reducing their emissions. And that means um, a lot of small and medium enterprises all over New Zealand who are um, the, the organisations and the people who supply um, those, uh, those big businesses. And so um, I think there is a real opportunity here to link up uh, what's going on at the big end of town right through the value chain uh, and, uh, right across New Zealand. Um, and actually we can dovetail that with uh, supporting and helping each other through the COVID crisis as well. If we're thinking about um, you know, who it is we sell to or who it is we buy from, um, and how we can help each other out in terms of uh, the challenge that's in front of all of us over the long term of reducing our emissions, we can dovetail that with a question of how do we help each other get through uh, the, um, the, the downturn as a result of the uh, COVID-19 virus. So um, recognizing um, that 
it is going to be quite a struggle to keep the lights on uh, for the next few months. I think now is actually an appropriate time to be making some of those uh, some of those plans. And I know from my own um, career in, in business uh, before I got into politics, one of the one of the things that became evident is that businesses who are able to and who choose to invest uh, during a downturn actually come out the other side of it much much stronger than the ones that just end up kind of retrenching and, and cutting back and they find that they cut too close to the bone and then once the recovery uh, rolls around, they don't have enough infrastructure to be able to build on. Now, I know that that's not always possible for every business, but you know I think that's the kind of mindset that we, that we need to go into this, which is to be taking this moment to be thinking about, well, what, what does the future look like? Uh, what can the future look like? Um, which is a more expansive way uh, of thinking and I think gives us a bit more hope than, you know, if you just look at the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there and I, uh, I'm looking forward to um, Rachel giving me lots of challenging questions, as always. Many thanks, James. Uh, it's actually going to be me asking the challenging oh, questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe not in the same style as Rachel, but I'll give it a go. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so um, th these are some questions that have been received from, you know, the attendees. So we're delighted with, um, to be able to pass these on. Um, I, I guess, you know, firstly, and you've kind of alluded to some of this, but what do you think is at stake in terms of the, the key choices made now, you know, in terms of this government's recovery plans and investment? How important is this time? I can't understate how important it is. Um, let me put it this way, that we are borrowing tens of billions of dollars of our children and our grandchildren to get us through the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and if we fail to do anything about climate change, we are also borrowing tens of billions of dollars off our children and our grandchildren because they're going to have to pay for the costs of adapting to the effects of climate change. So I think that we have both a moral duty um, and also an extraordinary opportunity to say, well, look, if we have to spend all of this money now getting ourselves through the crisis, we really ought to spend it on things that fundamentally put us onto a lower emission pathway, because otherwise we're actually saddling our children and grandchildren with a double whammy. Um, and saying, well, we're borrowing off you to help us get through this crisis, but we're borrowing from you again um, by uh, maintaining the high emissions um, ec economy that, that uh, we've had in the past. So it's, so it's critical. And given the sums of money that we're talking about, um, you know, we, for their sake, we really can't afford to mess it up. Absolutely. Um, so in, in terms of... Um, you know, what is your vision for how that funding might be spent? Where do you see the, the really key areas at this time that offer the, the, the best opportunity to spend wisely? Well, I think that the, so there's, there's two things. I think there's areas of the economy um, and then there's the kind of decision making criteria. And I'll, I'll start with the decision making criteria. So I said that the, that, that medium time horizon is going to be very much focused on employment. So one of the, one of the criteria should, we should be thinking about is jobs created per dollar spent. And I'll, I'll give you an example in the construction sector. <clears throat> um, residential construction employs more people than vertical construction, uh, so taller buildings. Um, and then vertical construction employs more people per dollar spent than horizontal construction, i.e. roads or um, you know, kind of ground level infrastructure. And that's because ground level infrastructure is highly um, uh, automated. You know, there's a lot of machines involved. Um, whereas residential is still very uh, kind of labor intensive. So that gives you a sense of saying, well, uh, we need to do a lot of all three of those things. Um, but if you have to prioritize, wouldn't it make sense to prioritize your expenditure in the areas that create the greatest employment, which in this particular case, is residential. Now you then dovetail that with 
a question around, well, what are the long-term challenges facing New Zealand? And as it happens, um, residential housing, as we know, is one of the uh, big structural problems that we have. Um, and we have to build, you know, before the crisis, we knew we had to build a lot more houses in this country. That issue hasn't gone away. Um, so uh, therefore, you might say, well, um, uh, building a lot of homes seems like a pretty good choice for how you start to um, uh, resuscitate things. Now, um, in addition to that, um, you know, those, I know there'll be people from the Green Building Council and others, um, architectural organisations and so on, uh, who um, want to see us build a much, much higher quality housing um, where uh, we're building kind of high thermal performance homes, um, ones that generate a reasonable amount of their own um, power or water needs uh, and have the kind of infrastructure in place to deal with the shift to electric vehicles, demand management, software for electricity, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So if we're going to be building um, a lot more houses, can we build them to those higher standards as well um, and, uh, and ensure that the next generation of housing um, uh, meets those kinds of um, sort of fit for the future uh, type arrangements. So that so there's that. Now the next thing is sort of categories. Um, so if you look at uh, every area of the uh, of the um, kind of infrastructure, um, you've got uh, our schools and hospitals have not kept up with um, uh, the maintenance or the growing population. Um, housing. Um, free waters infrastructure is famously degraded, um, especially if you're a Wellingtonian, you know what, what the consequences of that are. Um, you, uh, we've also got fresh water, um, so uh, rural waterways where um, we know that part of the solution is fencing and planting. Um, you've got uh, energy and industrial heat in particular uh, and, and, and um, um, uh, electric uh, cars and so on and the infrastructure required for those. You've got transport where in pretty much every domain, um, including roads, we actually haven't kept up with population growth over the course of the last 30 years, so in particularly the last 10 years. Um, but public transport, cycleways, walking, you know, every, every, every mode of transport requires attention um, and, and so on. So, you, so that gives you a sense of going, well, crikey, there's a lot to be done. Those things were there to be done before the crisis hit. Um, it just so happens that we're about to sp spend tens of billions of dollars. Those things would be at the top of my list. Mm, great. Um, so, so in terms of you know how to encourage that lens to be put on the decision making at this time, you know what 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 are you doing behind the scenes to kind of um, get those messages across and and also and what support do you need from us as a business community well um, I'm going to focus on the second part of that question <laughs> <laughs> so um, and you know uh, essentially what I'm doing is conversations with my ministerial colleagues right with um, Grant Robertson um, Minister of Finance who's leading the economic recovery program uh, um, the other budget ministers, so I'm an associate finance minister in addition to being minister for climate change. The other associate finance ministers are Shane Jones and um, uh, David Parker. Uh, and so um, the, that, that group will be uh, making quite a lot of the decisions around the shape of things. And so um, needing to just work with them pretty closely. Um, but also you've got uh, Phil Twyford who, um, you know, as Minister for Transport and for um, Urban Development uh, is a, is pretty important in all of this. You've got um, Megan Woods, who in addition to housing is Minister for Energy and Resources. Um, so she's pretty important in all of this as well. Um, and so if you think about it that way, uh, that gives you a sense of what the business community might do, um, which is to get in touch with those ministers and to say, hey, um, this is the shape of the recovery that we want. You know, we don't, we don't just want the same old thing. Um, uh, let's um, take this opportunity to, um, if we're going to be re rebuilding the economy, let's rebuild it not just for the here and now, but for the next 30 years. 
Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we're keen, uh, you know, as part of this forum um, process to collate ideas from our network um, and, you know, and feed them in. So we'll be, we'll definitely be encouraging, um, you know, You've got my us number. to use our influence. Sorry? You've got my number. <laughs> Great. Um, I just want, um, yeah, just a quick one here. Um, one question we had is um, from um, a company that's trying to establish uh, electric ferries and, and the observation has been made that it's been extremely difficult to kind of get um, financial support even before this period in sort of that low emission uh, innovation. Um, just wonder what, you know, what comments you could possibly make on that and in terms of, um, you know, in, improving the levels of support for that sort of innovation um, technology. Yeah, this is this has actually come up a few times. So, um, and I know, I, I suspect I know the, the company that you're talking about because there, there won't be too many um, battery electric um, ferry manufacturers <laughs> out there. Um, where you know they'd had a conversation with the Green Investment Fund, um, you know about the possibility of investing. And actually, the the Green Investment Fund is oriented at a later stage, which is really about um, uh, kind of scaling up um, kind of big solutions. And what and actually we've gotten this feedback from the Green Investment Fund is that there does appear to be in the government's uh, a kind of innovation system of support, if you like, a bit of a gap earlier. Uh, on in, in the process and whilst we've got um, you know organizations like Callahan and, and so on um, that the different pieces uh, that we've got in that chain so you know we've, we've got um, uh, kind of funds and incubators and support systems at, at most parts of the chain right from the very early um, you know idea generation stage right through to institutional investing through the NZ super fund and so on but those things aren't necessarily lined up in a in a pipeline um, yet, and and that is a piece of work that we need to do. Um, one of the things that David Parker uh, organised to get set up um, was there was a big gap, which is um, essentially at the stage that you're uh, that you're t talking about, and so um, there is I think about a two hundred and twenty five million dollar um, fund that has actually been administered via the super fund uh, on the more kind of early stage um, startups. Um, and so I'm not sure what whether that's managed to kind of get its doors open yet. My, my experience with Green Investment Fund suggests that whilst we might have made the budget allocation, it can take quite a long time to actually get the organization operational, you know, recruit people get an office, all of that, all of that kind of jazz. And so um, that may not, that may not be operational yet, but I think that might be the place to look for. That's mm. the support. Great. Thank you. Um, we, we also had a question, specific question on open ocean aquaculture and um, the expansion and development of that as a, as a, you know, means to, um, uh, you know, support economic development. Uh, any observations on, you know, your views on the potential for the expansion of that around New Zealand? Yeah, look, I, I think that there is a real opportunity there, um, uh, both open water and also there's clearly some moves to land-based aquaculture as, uh, as well in various parts of the country. Um, and if you think about it in a, in a broad sense, um, fish uh, are the only um, food source where humans still operate as hunter-gatherers um, and, and the problem with our hunting and gathering is that there's um, a lot of us <laughs> um, and, our, and our methods are becoming increasingly sophisticated and that's um, you know leading to a, a you know degradation of, um, of fish stocks even in a comparatively well-managed um, uh, system like we have in, in New Zealand. Um, but it is an area that is pretty fraught um, and we've noticed that the vested interests that are at play are extremely powerful and it is quite difficult to get change um, in, in that industry. So it's definitely something that we're paying attention to, um, but it's one of those areas where um, change is proving slow. 
um, and we really do need some of the industry players to um, uh, to lead that innovation. Cool. Um, just one final one. I think we've got time for one final one. This is one that's actually come through um, from a attendee this morning. Um, in, in terms of, um, you, you know, the, the sort of frameworks that can be used to, um, you know, guide us at this time, you know, living standards framework, um, the donuts economics view, um, you know, recently Amsterdam have indicated that they're going to follow, you know, a recovery based on a donut economics approach. Um, yeah, do you have any comments on that and whether that's being talked about in the, you know, within that group of finance ministers? And yes, it is. Well, uh, n not so much the donut economics um, explicitly, but the the living standards framework um, and their whole approach to wellbeing economics that um, this government's been pursuing since we since we got elected. Um, it has the advantage of uh, it being an existing treasury framework, which is grounded um, pretty strongly in a group of um, OECD. Um, sustainable development principles and so um, because it's there um, and because we've had a few years of experience in using it and finding out what works and what doesn't work it is certainly a filter that we that we are um, that we are applying um, there are others as well the, the World Bank actually about two days ago put out a really good um, quite straightforward uh, two-page checklist which said look if you're going to be spending money revitalizing the economy here is a set of filters that you might want to think about that through and about 20 percent of that was of, of of that paper was built around um, that need to shift to a low carbon uh, economy and mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm feeling reasonably confident that there's an openness there to that um, but it's by no means guaranteed, which is why I revert to my previous answer about the kind of support that we could get from the business community. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, because there will be those who just say, you know, what we need to do right now is just build more motorways. Um, and, um, and frankly, we just can't afford to do that one more time. Mm, great. Yeah, we've, um, we've recently shared the principles that the Climate Change Commission chair circulated. Um, the great set of six principles, including that need to measure more widely than GDP. Um, that, that's really great, James. Um, my final question was going to be, what was the one thing um, you know you would ask of businesses at this time? But you've kind of already answered that. You know, um, make sure we're heard, and the progressive side of the sector yeah. is heard. Yeah, speak up. Now is the time. Wonderful. I know you have to be away at 9.30. Is that, is that the case? Yeah. So, um, I'm actually about to talk to the Chair of the Climate Change Commission, so I'll um, tell him you said hi. <laughs> Wonderful. Many thanks again. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Rachel. Really appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Okay, um, that was uh, very interesting. Hopefully um, people enjoyed and found that um, informative um, and many of your questions were were answered. I know m m several weren't, but apologies, we couldn't get through all of them. Um, I'm now obviously delighted to hand over to um, my boss, Rachel Brown, who's the CEO of the Sustainable Business Network. Um, Rachel's obviously been in this space for um, several decades um, and is really keen that we use this opportunity. So Rachel, over to you to talk about your ideas, our ideas. Uh, kia ora tato. a big thank you, Phil. I just need to work out how to now share uh, my screen. Is it shared all right? Yes, it's shared. It's not full screen yet. Okay. It's not in slideshow mode. Ah, every time I go up to do that, it won't let me, but let me just work out how to do that. All right. Uh, kia ora tato. As uh, the minister's talked about, this is going to reflect his presentation quite well, I think. There's a lot of common ground there, which I guess is not that surprising. 
Um, but what we're going to be talking about now is basically the flow that we've gone through this year, which has been one of the craziest years of uh, most of our lives, I'd be assuming. But the focus of this is, is really on resiliency to regeneration. Um, and we're going to start back uh, at the beginning of the year and then work our way through uh, to a collective piece of action that SBN is really keen uh, to lead on, um, but we definitely need your support. So I'm going to run us through about a 15 to 20 minute uh, slideshow. So, so uh, I hope you enjoy this or find it useful. Uh, so for many of you, uh, like us, 2020 felt like a really important year. Uh, 2020 vision was what we were talking about uh, within our own organization at our awards last year. We were feeling like this was the year that we we're going to really crank into some positive action around all the work that we we're doing. In front of you, you can see the key projects that we were gearing up to run this year. We're still wanting to run those projects, but boy, uh, this happened. COVID hit um, really early in the year, and it's been one hell of a, a disruption. Uh, what we've been looking at then is what does SBN do now uh, and how do we help those amazing businesses that are part of our network who have all been working so extraordinarily hard to make this a regenerative um, and positive future for us and for our children and for the generations that come. So we spent some time working out what we need to do now, pivoting like most of our members have. Uh, through this process. Uh, we've got three things that we're working on essentially co concurrently. Uh, the first one is being resilient, so that's supporting people and encouraging them to stay at home and work from home to stay safe. We've also really focused on looking after our own team and spent a lot of time understanding what's going on with our membership. So our membership team's been going out there and doing a lot of that. We're also really encouraging people to be generous. Um, those of us who are still working and still being paid, for example, versus those of us who don't get the luxury of being paid at the moment um, as they're waiting to find out what's gonna come next. What we're doing is connecting and understanding our members' needs and helping them to understand their own supply chain needs, but also their customer issues. And we're really wanting to understand how we can provide the best support for our membership, but also across our membership as they're starting to come out of lockdown themselves. How do we start to support them and, and um, start buying from them and start getting that money flow around going again? And then the last piece is really focusing on that regenerative economy rebuild, which we've just been hearing James Shaw talking about. So the idea of collaborating to support great businesses that really fit in the economy that we want where people in nature prosper. So I'm gonna talk a bit about that in the last part of my slideshow. Uh, what, three and a bit weeks ago, we found ourselves in queues outside supermarkets really wondering how we're gonna get through this, but also fighting for flour and toilet rolls, things that we never really thought about and starting to really honor those workers that we now refer to as our essential workers, because actually they're the most important uh, part of our economy right now, those essential workers. And we really uh, wanna acknowledge those guys because they we know they're putting themselves in a dangerous situation and providing an essential role. The other thing that we've done, and I need to uh, acknowledge Phil Jones here, was that we had a look to see what's the impact on climate of the lockdown period. And cutting a very long story short, we basically discovered that our carbon emissions had dropped by, if we did this for the whole year, about a quarter. So this is essentially the level that we need to be operating in terms of carbon emissions if we're going to meet the Paris Agreement. It's about a quarter of a drop. That doesn't include the um, agricultural sector because they're still providing the food we're currently lining up for a really important part of our economy. But we can do this stuff. This is just not the way that we want to do it. The other thing that a lot of people have noticed that it's globally happening, Papatua Nuku is actually breathing right now. Uh, she's getting a chance to have a break. All that busyness that we put onto the planet is finally getting a chance to do its own breathing. Our water is clearing up, our air is clearing up, it's more silent, animals are starting to show up again in our systems, and we're noticing that. It's a really beautiful time for nature. Again, this wasn't really the way that we planned it, because the social problems that are growing in New Zealand 
we were there before, but now they're really accelerating. We're hearing about growing unemployment. We know the numbers are going to keep growing for a while. Homeliness, homelessness is going to continue be, to be a problem. We can solve that. The other thing that's happening is that we're getting more domestic violence uh, through this highly stressful time. So this is not the way to reform our economy. It's a disruption and it's really uncomfortable. So for us, this is a really important time for us to rethink all those negative social, economic and environmental impacts of the business as usual model haven't gone away. They're not going to go away for a long time. They were unsustainable then. They still are, unless we really think about a redesign of the way that we do business these days. And that's what we're really trying to encourage. Now, this is a little bit of a complicated uh, dump of my brain, but what I'm trying to explain here is, oh, if you look at the, um, the circles on the side, we are at the center of the changes that we make. So the way that we work and the way that we be right now is really important for the how we influence the economy, the businesses that we're in. Also, how do we affect our wider community, schools, businesses, um, medical facilities, all of those kind of things, and then how we connect with nature. So I'm suggesting on the other side that we as individuals have more power than you can imagine right now. And we can't expect individuals, even James Shaw and others, just to do this on their own. So we need to come together. We've got to change the way that we do this. Put people in nature at the center of all those decisions. It's the most important thing. We need to integrate the wisdom of matauranga Māori. We haven't done that well. We've been talking about it, but now's a chance to do that. We need to get really good at working across boundaries. Partnerships are really critical now. We need to have a go at things that we weren't prepared to do before, start them and adjust them as we go. We need to really get onto system systemic thinking and do that in a collaborative way because no one business is going to solve this alone. And particularly now, we need to be more courageous than we've ever been in the past. When we think of courageous people, Greta is one of those people that comes to mind. She represents our kids that James was talking about before. We are taking money from these guys and from their children to fund what we're doing right now. We want to make sure that we're creating the future these kids are screaming for. The other thing is that people my generation and older, some are really well resourced to help to invest in the future that we want. So I want to encourage generosity here with those 2000 extremely wealthy individuals. Could you please start to come together and fund the future that we know cross generations that we need. So I'm going to quickly talk about the nine uh, aspects of um, the work that we believe is needed now. There's a lot of cross-cutting with the work that James has talked about, but there's nine ways we want to see us building better. We want to see a system now that is redistributive with its wealth. This growing inequality, which is going to continue intergenerationally, has got to come back down. A little bit like with how we flattened the curve with COVID, we want to do the same kind of thing with uh, our welfare. We also want to make sure that we're regenerative for people in nature, not just sustaining the current model, because we don't actually want that. We want to improve it, we want to improve nature, we want to improve the systems that we live in. So how do we do that? The first one I think is really important, um, and James did hit on this and says that there's some desire to do it, but I don't see that happening in real life. I sit on a couple of panels, I'm hearing a lot of pressure from government to introduce these stimulus things that are going to quickly create work. But what I'm thinking that they need to do right now is that they need to use the stimulus package based on well-being, circular climate filters before they approve any development, not just focus on jobs for jobs sake. We have to make sure that we focus on jobs that are also going to improve things for everybody, for circularity and for climate. The wellbeing framework is a great framework that you could base it off, so we should use it. And I want to make sure that circular economy is also figured in there. And for the progressive, maybe councils, they could start looking at donor economics and go that step further. Amsterdam have done it. Auckland might be the next one to do it. I'm really hoping they will be. The other thing that we're hearing is to bring those investments forward as we transition to this fairer uh, future that we're after. 
We did some work about two years ago with AT. I want to acknowledge AT here. Uh, we discovered that with addition, in addition to economic activity, we can reduce carbon emissions by just under 3,000, but we could also liberate $8.8 .8 billion in the Auckland economy alone if we start using resources more efficiently and thinking in circular situation. We know there's a lot that we can do there and I'm going to talk about some of those soon. The other thing is that we know we need to do some reskilling. There's a lot of people out of work at the moment. There's a lot of people with some time to learn, which is why we've open sourced our training so that anyone can learn from it. But we're also really noticing that there's going to be some new skill sets that need to be build, built. And it's also an opportunity to build back trust in the communities. Trust has been one of those things that institutionally people have lost our confidence in any system out there other than business. The most um, trusted set of, uh, of these three, four organizations right now is business. People believe that business community is the one that can lead on this, but they want to see partnerships happening with business, with NGOs, and potentially also with media, so that we can build back stronger and have a community that's ready to go on this new way of working. As Phil mentioned, and so did the minister a little earlier, big piece of work that we're wanting to push for is around climate change action. What, what the minister mentioned is large corporates are getting better and understand their function and climate action. But what we know, and we've done some research about this, which we'll share in a couple of weeks, uh, SMEs don't know what to do. They are getting very confused about the role that they need to play and they need simple time cost effective solutions. So this is what this is about. This is a collaboration and I really want to acknowledge Ika and their Gen, Le Gen Less work and also Waka Kotahi, which is the New Zealand Transport Agency, for coming together and being the first seed funders of this piece of work. We want this to be so easy for SMEs to use so they know what to do and they can get cracking with um, low carbon actions as fast as we can because they need to be resilient so that the next shock, if it's climate related, they know how to respond to it. We also want to bring in those big corporates who can use their influence to start to really signal through supply chains and customer packages, the kinds of solutions that will also help SMEs to join this game. The other thing, and this is something that we've been part of uh, just recently, is coming together to work out how we can invest in that restoration and conservation sector. This is something that's been used in history before to regrow jobs. It's also something New Zealand desperately needs. We know that we've been talking about the Million Trees Fund and the Billion Trees Fund from government. And, you, and we've been operating the Million Metre Streams project for quite some years now. And we're generating some good income, nearly $2 million directed right at uh, landowners and waterway restoration. These things create work and they're really useful ways of getting people into good, meaningful jobs. The same thing could be said about our oceans. We heard about the aquaculture before, but the oceans are uh, one of those beautiful opportunities, not only as carbon sinks, but also food sources. And we know that there's a lot of work to be done and they're very keen to see more of that happening because our oceans are also good conservation spaces too. Kelp is a massive opportunity for New Zealand. Then I think given the times that we're in, we need to obviously prepare business for localization. Uh, the tourism sector we've heard is really going to be impacted heavily through this. So we know that there's a lot of work about how do they give back more than they take. There's been a, a, a lot of work and a lot of thought in this. And I think as uh, Kiwis, and particularly those of us who might have traveled offshore, now's the time to really invest back into our tourism sector locally. We also know that regenerative agriculture, where we start to really uh, put some effort into soil and carbon back into soil is a very important movement that started in New Zealand and bring in the organic sector. And we have a very strong story to tell in a much safer, much healthier system for waterways and for people's health. We also need to think about food diversity right across the um, growing spectrum, urbanization of the food systems, letting people grow their own food in the urban centers so that we're not having to ship food around the country as much. 
And then of course there's food waste to biogas. So we know that that investment is, provides a really good return rather than creating methane. The seventh one is investing in the low carbon mobility. James talked about this before. Congestion is one of those massive costs that we have. So just replacing cars for cars is not the solution. We have to get people out of cars. There's lots of ways that we can do it. Uh, more cycling infrastructure, for example. Then there's the story that we heard about for the movement of all of our vehicles from buses to ferries across to electrics. And then we have beautiful results, which I won't talk about. Wonderful story about car sharing. Do we really need to own our own cars anymore? Probably not. Now's the time to start moving out to these kind of new systems. The other one is investing in sustainable cities. And boy, there is so much information about how we can do this. I've seen a wonderful pitch from Auckland Council just recently about how they would do it, just acknowledging Alec Tang there. Uh, for the work that he's been pitching into the Auckland Council as part of their rebuild. Absolutely support what he's asking for. Infrastructure, wider footpaths, safer for cyclists, getting cars out of the way, excellent. Green buildings, also mentioned earlier by the Minister, we need to invest in the green building infrastructure in New Zealand. We actually know what to do, we just need to do it. There's also the Circular Economy Model Office Guide that we created a few years ago. So for anyone who's doing retrofits, there is more information that, than you can uh, throw things at. Uh, so we should start doing more of that. We need to change the way, change the practices and reskill our workforce to be able to deliver the homes that we need uh, and retrofit in a better way. And finally, we're really interested in investing upfront for waste minimization. We know that from the work that we've been doing in plastics, the system is fairly broken in New Zealand, but we can come together and fix it. We're one of those countries that is small enough to do this well. We know who the key players are, so we can actually solve these things. We also have a massive opportunity with organizations like Scion, who want to create new uh, materials that could actually switch us out away from fossil fuel based materials. And those are circular innovations that New Zealand could be doing and making good contribution towards. So those are the nine areas that we are feeling need to be pushed through. Um, we're really interested in your feedback. Have we missed anything here? Uh, those are the things that we think are really important. Um, after this, I understand that we're going to be sending out a survey and getting your feedback on that. Um, what are the jobs? Where's the investment needed? And what's the story that we can tell New Zealand about these kind of opportunities as a nation? So I really look forward to hearing from you and thank you so much uh, for your time uh, this morning. I'm very much looking forward to the next part of this discussion. Kia ora. Um, many thanks, Rachel. Um, yes, really keen to get your views on um, you know, where you think the best opportunities lie, as Rachel mentioned. Delighted now to introduce um, Mike Bennett, who is the CEO of Z Energy, and also particularly relevant for this morning, um, the chair of the Climate Leaders Coalition. Um, and Mike, really keen to hear your views on um, where we are at the present time and what, um, what our priorities should be moving forward. Thank you. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa, uh, everybody. Really pleased to be with you this morning and, and share a couple of thoughts. Um, I have not had the, uh, the time to actually prepare a fancy presentation, but here's my picture anyway. So I've done a, I've done a mind map, so every now and then I'll glance down and, and refer to my notes if I can. I, I just speak uh, with a couple of hats on, actually. One is as a convener of the Climate Leaders Coalition, but I also run a large company um, here in New Zealand and the large company that I happen to be responsible for is a, is a big part of the emissions that we see uh, every day. So I'm um, yeah, as much part of the problem as I am part of the solution. I thought I'd talk about three things. A couple of lessons I think we can draw from um, the current pandemic crisis as it relates to sustainability. I want to talk about a couple of the implications that I certainly are seeing and experiencing right now. And then a couple of ideas on how we could align our pandemic response to making progress on sustainability. So three, three areas. I think the first lesson I can talk about is uh, the lesson of what I call weak signals. And this is something I'm really present to in the role that I have. I've been in the, the health and safety business um, 
by being part of the energy sector for a you know, long period of time. And the, the worst incidents or accidents that actually happen in our sector are because we ignored the weak signals on the way through. So I think in this context, we've ignored two sets of weak signals. One is the near miss pandemics or global pandemics that we've seen over the last uh, two to three decades, starting with SARS back in the early 2000s, uh, MERS, um, you know, sort of five, six years ago, and, and clearly our coronavirus right now as well as how different countries have responded to this um, current threat. If you take, say, New Zealand and you contrast it with the actions of America, where New Zealand you know, looked at those weak signals and, and be, frankly benefited from what other countries were doing well or not well ahead of us, and then how America uh, has responded relatively poorly time-wise to that. So there are weak signals here that I think are, are really important lessons for us to learn. I think the second lesson that I would point to is this is what system level collapse looks like as a result of exponential change. Or put another point, uh, put another way, in, in, in a climate change uh, context, this is what it looks like when you get past the tipping point. So what I mean by that is, and you've probably seen all the graphs that I have, is that you have the odd case and you worry a little bit about the people you were importing into the country that bring the virus back and then we start to get concerned about community transmission and all of a sudden the graph just goes right up exponentially. That is what science has been telling us around the risks of tipping points around climate change. So I think that's the second lesson we can draw from this. Getting more perhaps towards the upside, um, I think the other lesson we can learn is what does it look like when New Zealand mobilises with a sense of urgency around something that matters to us all? Um, I read a great book many years ago called Requiem for a Species, um, where the central thesis was that we treat climate change like death. We all know um, it's going to happen to us one day, but it's so far in the future, we don't have to do anything about it um, today. But I do think we have seen a fantastic community response um, from New Zealand, for New Zealanders, in the way in which we uh, responded to this pandemic. I think then the fourth thing to come more directly to climate change, as I understand, is some of the impacts of climate change is, is clearly that places get warmer. So we could end up in a situation where a place like Northland becomes subtropical or even potentially tropical in its outlook. And so tropical diseases like, say, malaria can start to become more prevalent in a country like New Zealand that we've never seen before. So again, I'm, I'm now looking at a weak signal directly between the pandemic and, and climate change. We should expect more pandemics as a result of viral pandemics, as a result of climate change, because the whole place warms up and we become one big petri dish. In, in terms of the implications, uh, a couple of positive things that I see here, actually, um, and I was really pleased to see some of it in Rachel's presentation. We can clearly see the benefits of lower emissions across the globe. Um, I'm in the oil business, so I happen to know a bit about it, is, is right now oil demands are 30 year low. So we effectively have an environment today that's the way New, uh, New Zealand was or the world was 30 years ago. And that manifests where you see the, uh, if you like, the canals in Venice clean themselves up miraculously uh, to the extent that we now have dolphins swimming around those canals. So if anything, I think a positive benefit we do get to see here is this is what it could look like if we did take action around climate change and not in the way that we, at one extent, we you know, completely compound or implode the economy, but actually this is what success could look like. And again, I'd go back to what Rachel said around New Zealand's carbon emissions are currently at 25% of um, what they would otherwise be, which is the target we need to hit. So I'm, I'm very impressed by that, um, that particular point. I think secondly, uh, this is uh, another positive we see here is we can see the benefits of collective action. And I talked about that as being a, a weak signal. But yeah, this is where I think New Zealanders are starting to become much more mindful of what it means to act as a community, how we should be acting in uh, community interest. I spent a lot of my working career working in different parts of Asia. And just culturally, the Asian community tend to go in a hierarchy of country community, family, self, whereas if it goes perhaps more to a North American model, it's, it goes in the other order. So I'm particularly struck about how perhaps New Zealand fits in the, in the middle of those two paradigms. But I think that's something that we can learn from as well as collective action does make a difference. The third thing I think that could be a positive that comes out of this is the humanity of it all. I mean, I've heard um, people starting to have discussions around the, the, the dinner table around, well, actually, 
how do I feel about my previous consumerism? Uh, now I don't have the chance to order in uh, Uber Eats or have meal delivery or go out and eat so much. So now I'm cooking more at home. I'm using perhaps fresh produce. So I'm conversing more around the dinner table because we're all, we're all eating collectively in a way that we haven't done before. And I'm not saying that's happening in every family in New Zealand, but I do think that's another opportunity, uh, a positive implication here is that I think many people, not all, but many people are reflecting on their own humanity and the way in which they can start to perhaps rethink or reset some aspects um, of their lives. There are some neg negative implications to this, and, and James spoke about some of them early on in a way that I think was, was positive in the sense that he sees this as an opportunity for government. Um, but yeah, one of my you know, concerns as a business leader is, is that uh, individuals, families, businesses, and potentially government turn their attention to much more immediate needs so what I mean by that is sustainability or the effort, the resources, the, the emotional energy required to sustain what we need to do to, to moderate the impacts of climate change actually are now replaced by much more immediate social and economic concerns. And that's totally understandable. And as I said, the, in some respects, the further you get away from uh, central government policy making and the closer you get to if effectively your family, those needs become much more apparent um, uh, for you. So I've, I've, I'm a big follower of an organization called Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, BNEF, and they write some very, very um, good stuff around what uh, energy futures look like. So as I said, I've been a big fan for many years. And they're talking about how that um, at, a, at a global level, and they're not casting this in a way that's a judgment on any particular country or community, but they're saying that the, the sheer economics of it all now means that it's highly likely that progress around the transition to the low carbon future is going to be uh, delayed or deferred by a few years. And that could be, depending on what research you read, anywhere between sort of two to five years. And I think that's a really important thing. With the, the money that we had available as businesses um, and or governments that could have been directed towards helping accelerate that transition or creating subsidies or mandates for that is now going to be redirected towards things that create um, employment. And I saw this actually in, in 2008. I, I was overseas at, um, at the time. And in my experience, at that point in time, Europe was really on the cusp of a, what I thought was going to be a, a big breakthrough around the response to climate change. And then the GFC happened, September 2008. Um, it all got uh, very, very terrible very, very quickly. And I think we lost about eight to 10 years worth of momentum because of that single um, global financial crisis. And in my, in my personal view, the implications from this current pandemic are going to be uh, larger and longer than what the GFC was uh, um, just over 10 years ago. So that's, I'm, I'm somewhat pessimistic about the future actually because um, the, the attention just gets directed to such um, or much more immediate uh, concerns. And I think the third point I think is a potential negative implication here is when, um, again, when humanity, when people at the individual level go through so much change and it's so disruptive in such a short period of time, they very, very, very much want to go back to the way it was. And again, uh, James spoke about this in his opening remarks. And that's very, very, uh, if anything, easy for governments and businesses to allow their people or support their people or even indeed encourage their people to go back to the way it was because that actually stops the anger that follows the current fear that we all have around a pandemic. And you know, in some respects, governments and businesses are incentivized to not make uh, their constituents or their customers angry. So that's, that's sort of my third negative implication actually is that the, the momentum to hold the status quo is so strong because people having got through that phase of fear around a crisis it then turns to anger. One of the easiest ways to moderate that anger is to simply go back to the way it was. So as I said, I have a, a significant concern that these negative implications can really start to cloud the way in which um, government, businesses, NGOs uh, are all making their um, decisions around how we go forward. So relatively bleak on that side, I'm, I'm afraid. But sort of finish on something more of a positive, if I can, if I can talk about how I think we can align our pandemic response to making progress on sustainability. So acknowledging what I've just said. So how can we, 
how might we go about this in a way that actually moderates or indeed eliminates those negative implications? I think the, the first thing I'd say here is um, never waste a good crisis. And, and one way of talking about that is, um, and I can't actually think of a, of a kind of a polite way to say this, is um, people's reluctance or resistance to change is incredibly low in the middle of a crisis. And I even know that within my own organisation, we had a bunch of things we planned to do in, in the current financial year. And we had a big change programme built around that. And it was going to take us 12 months to get it all done. I actually think now we can get it done in three months, simply because people's resistance to change is so low, or to put it more positively, their willingness to try something new to, to moderate the impacts of the bad things that are happening right now enables you to get out to change much quicker. So what I'd be saying there is if um, government and business want to get after change at a systems level, in some respects, we have a very, very narrow window to do something about that because this resistance to change is only low while you're in that um, fearful phase or that scared phase. Once you move into the phase called grief or anger, then the resistance to change goes up um, significantly. So at one level, um, if we're going to do anything around responding to this pandemic that enables us to take big steps on sustainability. And in some respects, we've got, a, we've got a couple of months where I think we're in that ideal sweet spot where the resistance to change is low and we can make some significant progress at the systems level. Uh, the second thing I think we can do here is as we go about making choices and how we do respond to the pandemic is to get very, very explicit about the way in which we factor sustainability into our thinking. So again, if I came back to sort of the business I run, if we were looking at a business case for what we're going to do around how we respond, either uh, closing a gap around the pandemic or, or making a, a positive step forward, there should be a big question in there that says, and how can we or how might we take, uh, pro make progress or take meaningful steps on our sustainability agenda as a result of making this investment? So a couple of examples I would point to is, if we want to solve employment, uh, planting trees is a great way for uh, lower skilled uh, people to have employment, particularly on a regional basis. So it sort of accelerates some of the things perhaps that Shane Jones has been talking about for some time around getting uh, employed, people employed in planting trees. As we start to restart our tourism sector, should we really be going at that in the way in which it was before, which I would, you know, if I was to be critical, describe as sort of a, a scale response um, to tourism rather than saying actually let's pivot our tourism focus to be much more about niche to have far fewer people coming here paying a lot more money to create wealth for New Zealanders rather than many many people coming here spending um, a lot less per unit but having a much more profound adverse impact on, on our environment. And then how do we retrain our people to take advantage of the need to move to a low carbon um, economy? So if we do have a, a large number of unemployed people and we do need to put them through retraining, how can we focus that retraining with an eye towards the skills we need in a low carbon economy, rather than teaching um, people perhaps how to be uh, very skilled at the things that tend to be more backward um, looking. A third, um, third thing I would point to is actually, it's certainly not my idea, um, I read an article called Sanctuary in New Zealand by Fran Sullivan from New Zealand Herald uh, a couple of days ago. She talked about the idea of inviting uh, 2,000 high net worth individuals to New Zealand with $15 million each and give them the sanctuary that New Zealand provides in, in these types of environments and get them to invest directly um, in, our, in our country. And I thought that was quite an intriguing idea in itself. And it certainly enables us to skew that investment. So if people are turning up with $50 million, and it needs to be equity, by the way, not just uh, they come here and borrow money uh, but actually real real uh, cash injection into the economy from new money, that we skew that towards the, uh, the low carbon future that we need to have or any other aspect around um, sort of social and environmental sustainability. So that was quite a good idea. And again, we could take it a step further and make it particularly pointed around um, sustainability. Uh, the last point I'd want to make here is actually... Um, the whole globe, every country in the world, one way or another, is going through what we're going through right now. So I do think it's a real opportunity for us to be much more experimental in the way in which we do things, so we can share best practice or learn lessons. So again, I'll go back to how I started my, my comments. 
I think the government here benefited from other countries being two, three, four, five weeks ahead of us in terms of how the virus was impacting their communities and their economy, and we could learn from that. So as we start to rely on our pandemic response to the way in which we can make progress on sustainability, can we be running experiments in New Zealand that can prove out a model that could be scaled up or used in other countries? Or indeed, we should um, perhaps lift our eyes up a little bit more and not be so focused on New Zealand and say, how are other countries, communities or businesses uh, putting together the pandemic response with a, a big step forward on sustainability? And what can we learn from that? And how can we bring that back, that idea back to New Zealand, scale it up, or simply bring it, bring it back to New Zealand, New Zealand, uh, pivot it or, or change it in some way to match the, the unique context that we might think exists here in New Zealand. So I'm, I'm generally a glass half full person. Um, so I'm just conscious when I sort of scribbled my notes down this morning that I'm, I'm actually sort of neutral on this. I think this presents a wonderful, a wonderful opportunity uh, for all of us around how we can align the pandemic response with the steps we want to make around sustainability. And then a whole lot of things that make it way harder than ever before. And I'd almost go back to uh, refer to Rachel's slides earlier. And um, if each individual person does something about that, then there will be change. If we leave it up to somebody else, uh, then there will not be the change that I think we're mostly committed to. Uh, kia ora koutou, I'm happy to pause there. Wonderful, thanks Mike. Uh, lots of really interesting points and we will cover, you know, we'll cover them more in the panel Q&A. So I look forward to that. Um, thanks again. Um, so um, Mike obviously is uh, part of one of the largest businesses in New Zealand um, and a member of our network. Um, one of our um, features with SBN is, is a range of of businesses we have um, and many SMEs and many of those SMEs are really in that innovative um, you know part of the economy and one prime example is Zilch and we're delighted that uh, Kirsten Corson who's the general manager of Zilch is um, here to kind of give a SME perspective on these times and what it means and um, you know how we can really support SMEs at this time so Kirsten welcome. Thank you very much, Phil. Kia ora koutou, everyone. Nā mihi nui ki koutou. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and thanks for staying uh, zoomed in. Um, you know, just to reiterate, you know, we're all facing business challenges, and uh, they're business challenges that we've never seen before. And so, if ever there was a time for us to be smarter and to be bolder, it is now. So, what I'm keen to do today is just... Um, share some thoughts around mobility um, and, and challenge you, and, and challenge you to think differently. And as Rachel said earlier, uh, be more courageous. And because this is a, a time of opportunity as, as well as challenge. So I'm going to um, click over to a slideshow and uh, we will get into it. Okay, can you all see the slideshow? I'm, I'm hoping so. All good, Kirsten. Okay, perfect. We're away. We're away. So um, at Zilch, we're very um, data and numbers focused. So I'm just going to start off by throwing a few numbers at you and, and making you think about a few things. So if we, sorry, my slideshow doesn't seem to be responding. It's a bit of a challenge. There we go, we're in business. So if we think that uh, our fleet is 20% of New Zealand's carbon emissions, so it, it's, a, it's a relatively easy um, win for us. And, and if you think about your own cars that you've got within your business, 70% um, of, of new car purchases are made by businesses. And our staff that drive them are creating three times as much as emissions as as our private users and and typically a business is keeping a fleet for three to five years and then they're selling it to to the second hand market and that car stays in New Zealand for the next 10 years at least um, with within uh, private users so I just want you to consider 
you know, if you're going to be uh, putting cars in your fleet, that this isn't something that's just a three to five year decision for you. The impact on the New Zealand emissions is a lot more significant and a lot on a lot larger as well. So something to be mindful of. And James actually touched on this this morning when he spoke and, and that sustainability isn't just about carbon. And if we take a city like Auckland, you know, population growth is, is going to expand further further post COVID. So by the time we get to 2023, we're going to have 2 million people plus living in the city. And anyone that lives in Auckland, you know that there's 600 cars going on the road each week plus. And by 2023, we're going to have more than 500,000 cars on our road. And, and then already the cost of um, of having the cars that we've got on the road now is 1.3 billion on our economy with lost productivity. So as James mentioned this morning, you know, the answer for us isn't, isn't building more roads and, and we don't have the capital to do that. So we need to start making some smarter decisions. And, and if, you know, linking to those smarter decisions, I want you to think around these numbers. At, at the moment in New Zealand, we've got over $30 billion tied up in our vehicle fleet. So it's 30 billion that we could have invested in something that is actually creating and generating revenue because the majority of those vehicles are depreciating assets. And then if we take that a step further and look at our car fleet in New Zealand, that 5% of the time our car fleet is moving and 95% of the time it's, um, sitting idle. And, and then a huge social cost and financial cost, but a huge social cost is when we actually do get in those cars, that we've got the fourth highest accident rate in the OECD. So what the slide is telling us is we've got a huge amount of capital tied up in vehicles that we hardly ever use. And when we do use them, we're not doing a very good job driving them. So we need to make some smarter decisions. And I want to take this a step further. And, you know, a lot of you will be doing um, what, you know, what I've been doing as well, that going through your P&L, looking at, at your different um, cost lines, going, where can you take cost out of your business? And I think, you know, if, if you look yourself in the mirror, it, you wouldn't have started at your vehicle fleet. You'd be looking at, at your wage or your salary line and going, how... Um, you know, how can we make some um, adjustments in our business to survive this COVID pandemic? But when you think about it, would you employ someone and, and say to them, you can put your feet up on the desk for 95% of the time and you only have to work for 5% of your day. And that's exactly what we do with our fleet in New Zealand. So we're saying it's okay. You know, we've got all of our um, staff working from home, but we've got our cars sitting around being idle. So if, if you're looking to um, make some adjust adjustments in your business, um, I would encourage you to look at mobility because it is a way that, yes, it does require change and change is challenging at this time, but it's a lot easier to sell a Corolla than it is to make one of your staff redundant. So I would en encourage you to take a look at that line. Now, a few of you might be sitting there going, that's okay, Kirsten's not talking about me because I've put a few EVs into my fleet and, 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 and that's all good. You know, I'm, I can pat myself on the back. But I, I, I want to encourage you to think about the answer for New Zealand isn't just to replace our combustion vehicles with electric vehicles. We have to be better than that. We have to be smarter than that. And for us, sustainability is, is getting a 60% plus utilization out of an asset. So if I can set you some more homework, it would be to look at your fleet. And if you've got GPS, this is really easy. Um, otherwise, you'll be able to do some rough back of envelope calculations. How often are you using your cars? because uh, we can't just go, right, we're going to electrify New Zealand's fleet. We've already got $30 billion 
tied up in, in capital. So we can't afford to do that. We have to be smarter as a nation and we have to be smarter as businesses and go, let's actually look, do we need these cars in our fleet? Are there other mobility options that we could use for our business? Because that's what creating a sustainable um, business is all about. So I would, I would encourage you to do that homework as well. And I look forward to, to you selling a few cars. So I thought it was um, about time that I, I gave you a case study and an example of a business that has um, walked the talk from a sustainability point of, point of view. And I have to confess, it's not often I say great things about councils, um, but in, in this case, Christchurch City Council is a complete standout. So in, in 2015, they really recognised that they needed to make transformational change. And they, they had some significant issues that they could see. They really wanted to electrify their fleet and they, um, and they wanted to do that in a large scale. But they realised that financially for them with their ownership model, that was absolutely impossible. And it wasn't the best use of their funds. They could also see that there was a global shift happening and we've seen it with software as a service. They could see it coming uh, ahead of them with mobility as a service because let's face it, when, when cars go autonomous, we're not all gonna be owning cars. So they could see that, that shift coming, they could see um, bicycle share, they could see car share um, and that, that was before we even had things like Lime scooters hit our streets. So they could see mobility as a service was, was coming and they made an active decision to move towards it. They also recognised that their core business was focusing on creating a smart city. And whilst they needed mobility, having a fleet wasn't their core business. And it was actually more effective and they would save money if they outsourced it to someone else. And, and at that time in New Zealand, they, uh, this was a really bold move because we had car sharing, uh, but no one was doing it with a pure electric model. So they went, right, if we're going to do this, we really want to improve the air quality in our cities, in our city. So we want to do this with a, a pure electric model, which hadn't been done in the Southern Hemisphere before. And they also recognised as a city, they had a high accident rate they had high health and safety issues around vehicles. And so they were looking for a way to improve that as well. So in 2018, we, uh, we partnered uh, with Christchurch City Council. And at that stage, our business was called Yugo Share. And um, Christchurch City Council sold five of their Nissan Leafs and 50 of their Toyota Yaris um, vehicles in their fleet. They still kept their um, fit for purpose um, utes and vans in their fleet. Uh, but Yugo Shear or Zilch, uh, we put in 100 pure electric vehicles in that city and we installed 100 chargers and we put them in eight different locations. And then we really held the hands of the staff at Christchurch City Council. And at that stage, there was also 10 other businesses and the general public using the service. Uh, when, we, when we first launched. And now if we fast forward two years, um, it's been an incredible journey because we've taken people that were really resistant to change. A lot of them had been driving the same car for 10 years within council. And, and we really did have to support them with the change. And now we've taken them to a model where they love our cars, they use them privately outside of work, and, um, and we've had some huge wins for the city. Uh, for council now, they have over a, a thousand trips a month with us. Uh, that we've got over 5,000 users in Christchurch that use the service. And in total, we've had over 50,000 trips. And the neat thing about that is that we've saved 300 tonnes of carbon in Christchurch. And that's had a massive improvement on air quality. You know, there's over a thousand Kiwis that die, that die each year from air quality, um, air pollution related diseases. Uh, luckily, we're better than China. They've got a million that die a year. So that's had a, a big impact. And, and, you know, some of you will be going, well, where was the dollar savings uh, for Christchurch City Council? 
and they will be similar to majority of businesses in the country as they never needed 55 vehicles in their fleet. We give them monthly reporting on their utilization and so they can see the number of cars that they actually needed and they never needed 55 vehicles. And it was interesting, I was talking to a business yesterday and, and they said to me, look, we know we've got 30% more cars in our fleet um, than we actually need when we look at the utilization data. So it's great to see um, a business like Christchurch City Council as Rachel says, being bold and being courageous, and um, and certainly that's paid dividends for them as a city and for them as a business as well. So um, just to you know explain you know what we actually do, um, Christchurch City Council we're using our our standard car sharing service. So that's using technology to book the cars, using technology to open the cars. Um, there's no keys. Uh, and you just pay for the time that you actually use the cars. Um, this year, we've also been working on another product, which is our exclusive car sharing service, because we know that we've got a few businesses uh, that don't really like to share their cars with other people. Um, so we've developed a product, which is an exclusive car sharing service, uh, which opens the cars up to staff, um, to book privately that work within that business after hours as well as businesses um, using them during the day and we, we charge a monthly fee. So no matter what um, option you choose with us, um, the wins for Christchurch City Council is you know, what we've talked about and the wins for our other business customers have been reduced cost. Um, we give them a really easy way to measure their carbon. Obviously all of our cars are zero tailpipe emission vehicles so they can see um, what their carbon savings are by choosing to, to drive a, a zero emission vehicle. As I mentioned, they haven't got capital tied up in, in unproductive assets. And uh, you know, remember that's part of your homework. You need to look at how many unproductive assets you've got within your own fleet. Uh, a big win also is uh, the reduction in health and safety. Um, risk that we've we've delivered to our customers. They get a monthly invoice. It's very transparent what they're spending uh, on their fleet and they don't have to have staff managing the cars. Um, we manage all of them for, um, for them. So, um, you know, just in, in um, summing up, I'd just like to say, um, you know, be courageous, um, look, at, look at your fleet, um, yes, you know, as, as all the um, speakers already have said, it, it, change is challenging and it's particularly challenging um, now whilst um, there are, is a lot of uncertainty, but it also presents an incredible opportunity to us as a nation to be smarter. So I would encourage you to, to be smarter and, and to make some different steps with mobility. Thanks for listening. Wonderful. Thanks, uh, Kirsten. Really good to get that perspective, um, you know, in terms of an innovative C, um, you know, company um, trying to address one of the challenges, even in the better times of, you know, without the uh, disruption of COVID. Um, and, and I guess our challenge is how we can um, a support businesses like yours through this time, but also start more businesses like yours um, out of this time as well. So. Um, I think there's um, lots of really good questions that have come in um, on the um, on the question question and answer and also on Facebook. So um, I've uh, been busily noting down some and building on the you know the comments that um, you, you all have made. Um, hopefully everyone's off off mute. Um, Mike, um, maybe starting with some of your comments about um, you know how how we can lock in some of the the good things that are happening now or you know take advantage of this window of opportunity um, that you mentioned um, do, do you have any specific ideas on, on how much that might look um, within say your business or more generally 
Yeah, I think, um, uh, and actually, uh, I think Kirsten spoke to this in, in some respects. I think, yeah, well, actually, I just realised we're competitors because uh, Zed as a, a car sharing company in Wellington. Uh, I think so. If if um, if a if a business leader is trying to solve for the the immediate economic impact of COVID, sustainable solutions that save money are like no brainers. Mm-hmm. So I think that, um, and I noted there was a, a question that popped up on the on the Q and A here that were around um, how can sustainability managers you know, do better job with their CEOs? I think what you uh, again speaking as a CEO, I'm looking, I'm desperate for solutions right now, and that that more diverse thinking that can be applied to that problem is is outstanding so i think a sustainability manager if they can actually realize what's most important to the chief executive right now which is effectively preserving cash while we're all in lockdown um, and making the business more effective and efficient coming out of lockdown then that's the way in which you want to be pitching your ideas versus hey i've got a really great idea it's going to it's going to help us with our environmental impact and it's going to require more money if the CEO hears it that way, then I think there's going to be limited listening to that sort of thing. Rach, do you have anything to add to that? I was just thinking there's probably a lot of different examples of that happening across our organisation um, along the network at the moment. It'd be really interesting if, if CEOs were comfortable to share the kinds of um, choices they are making right now, um, Mike, so that other people can just, you know, because a lot of businesses um, just copy the, the intelligence from each other. So maybe that's going to be a useful thing to do. Yeah, I guess there's an opportunity of those projects that might be sitting in a kind of ideas box at the moment that, um, uh, you know, early stage concept or whatever. Now's the actual time to look at those again mm. and see what opportunity there might be. Um, mm. So we'd be really keen to hear of those kind of ideas. Um, I guess this builds on that in terms of, you know, the role for, for you know, government and business at this time. You know, um, it's really interesting to see, obviously, in a crisis, the government really takes the lead. They, you know, they basically are keeping the economy going in terms of the, the wage subsidy, etc. Um, do, do you see any... Um, and maybe Mike, to you again, do you see any, you know, any change that will come out of this time in that respect in terms of um, perhaps an increased acceptance of the importance of government to lead and, and in the context of, say, tackling the climate crisis as well? I think in a, in a crisis, you know, I'm going to be, be very generalised in what I say here. It's sort of two things happen. Either strong relationships are forged and cemented or else you know, fracture takes, takes place. So I think you know, provided we, we business and government continue to work together as productive as we have so far, then we should actually have stronger personal relationships, um, a deeper connection with one another and have learned how to work together collaboratively. That's all got to be very good as a foundation going forward. Can I just build on that? Because I absolutely agree with you, Mike. I think if you look at the Alderman Trust Barometer, it suggests that trust between all the institutions is really low and it's been dropping, particularly because people don't believe we're actually trying to create solutions that are in the interest of all of us, not just a small proportion of the society. So this gives us an opportunity to unite together business, NGOs, government agencies, business leaders like you, Mike, Uh, come together and talk about how we bring people together around a better future for everyone. And I think that's what we've got to be leaning into right now is to show the the various roles we all play in that positive future. I don't think government is going to be able to pull this off alone. We're going to have to really uh, bring the investment back in from the business community and as fast as we can, but leaning in the same direction. In terms of, you know, you all as business leaders, um, what would be the things that you would emphasise in terms of, you know, avoiding some of those pitfalls that, uh, Mike, you mentioned earlier, you know, this window of, of opportunity, what can, can you as business leaders do at this time? Rach, do you want to start? I was going to say, Kirsten's been quiet. I know, I know it's not often that I'm quiet. Um, 
I think this is an opportunity that we can share best practice and we can be open and we can look for collaboration uh, and that will make a significant um, impact and, and, and an openness to, to work. And as an example, um, you know, our business is part of a mobility solution, but it, it's not a total solution for a business. So it's working with, you know, the electric bike companies and scooter companies and public transport and um, cycling and, and looking at how can we create uh, an optimised product to meet the needs of our, of, you know, of all Kiwis, of our business customers and of our private customers. So that would be an example, you know, of where I, I see an opportunity. Mm. Yeah, I just, I think you're absolutely right, Kirsten. I think that um, the other thing that we really want to keep uh, focusing on is um, you shouldn't be designing your business model to suit today because it's going to change as we, whatever comes next, things are going to change. But we've just got to make sure that we respond to those same issues that were challenging us before COVID. Climate, waste, pollution, poverty, those issues are still there. So as a group, we have to think about climate, we have to think about adaptation, but we have to think about this fairer model. So what do you pay people? What's fair to pay people now? That big difference between the highly paid and the lowly paid people has just got to come down a bit. Um, I think in terms of how we fund these models going forward, we really do want to encourage generosity. I think, was it Fran you said, Mike? who came up with the 2000 um, wealthiest Kiwis. I think that's a fabulous idea. And building on that, how do you open up a fund like that? So individuals that are still working, I know a lot of civil servants, servants are still being paid full-time wages. Imagine if civil servants, for example, decided they had some spare cash that they also wanted to contribute to a cleaner, greener, fairer society across New Zealand and, and, and make it something we all pull together on. Um, the opportunities are huge right now, I think, for, for doing that. Mike, in, in, uh, maybe um, in the context of the Climate Leaders Coalition and the opportunities for that as a, as a group of leading businesses, you know, at this time, I, I don't know if you've had the, you know, any time to kind of think about how that might, you know, that existing um, coalition might, you know, leverage at this time. Oh, to be honest with you, they haven't given it any thought. Um, I'm too busy trying to keep my own organisation safe and reliable and, and look after our, our people and our customers. Uh, but again, I think it's a model like that that I think builds on what Kirsten and Rachel have, have talked about where you know, collaboration and the sharing of ideas, that's what that coalition is all about. So there's a chance to leverage that up in the current context. Sure. And Mike, we're very keen to work with the Climate Leaders Coalition on our work in the small and medium business space and work out what the influence and the power that big organisations like you who want to influence change um, can play in through procurement, through this, the um, services you provide uh, into this future and how do we bring it forward faster. Yeah, and, and for me, it's really that um, forward faster are the two uh, key things I'd just like to, to add to that because certainly, you know, Mike, the, the work that the coalition's doing is so important. And I guess I have to confess that I'm a very impatient woman um, that I look at things like, you know, fleets and go, come on, guys, we this is an easy win. We can move faster on this. And looking at shared models um, with different mobility providers. That's a really easy win. But so often it starts with the CEO and then it gets stuck in a quagmire of bureaucracy within an organization. And so I would just encourage um, that faster, moving forward faster. Because, you know, as we know, climate change is cumulative. So um, we don't have that luxury of, of delaying. The, the uh, a question that came through was um, uh, relating to, um, you know, local jobs and um, in terms of reducing commute times. I mean, obviously at this time, with every, nearly everybody working from home, um, we've realised that we can 
do a lot of what we normally do in the office at home. Um, some of us probably going a bit stir crazy, but um, you know, to what degree can we lock in some of those positive aspects? Mike, you referred to you know, leave, you know, building on the positive things that have happened. You know, how can we do that as you know, as businesses, to make home working more of an option more of the time? Mm. Right. Uh, can I talk to that? Yeah, we've been thinking about this a lot at the SBN. It was always a challenging thing for us to pull off for some reason, thinking technology was never going to be able to deliver. Uh, but now we've, de we've worked out it can. Uh, so the next thing is how do you trust your staff? Um, and we've been operating in this um, flexible working environment for years where we all, all of our team uh, work from different offices. They can work in cafes or wherever or at home. So um, we know it's doable, but I do think there's something about giving permission and trusting staff that needs to happen. I also recognise it's a bit of a luxury for some of us who are office bound or office workers. Um, if that's not your profession, um, working from home probably isn't something you can do very easily. So um, I'm not sure what the proportion of businesses that could do it, but I'm, I'm sure it's significant. Mike, do you have any comments? It, it's um, an interesting one for, for you in terms of uh, reducing transport need. Yeah, I think the, um, the, the challenge here is to, oh, how would I word it? I think I build on Rachel's point, there are some people that this opportunity is just simply denied to. And again, from a position of inclusiveness, how can we, how can we open up the benefits that come from what I will call flexible working? Because I think the, the phrase working from home is, is almost somewhat loaded. Like even your words, Rachel, how can we trust our people to work from home as opposed to actually our people are flexi working. They could be in the office, at home, in a meeting room, on their own, working in the cafe, a whole lot of places. So I think flexi working is something I think is really good socially as, as well as environmentally for all types of workers. And I'd just be encouraging all companies rather than be bound up by office space workers to think, what does flexi working look like for my employees and how can I support them with that? And that I think would lead to potentially greater social outcomes than we currently see by boxing people in or, or in a way that says uh, office workers can work from home, everybody else must then work from where they are. I much prefer the language around flexi working. Nice. Mm. Absolutely. One, one area we haven't explicitly talked about is um, climate adaptation um, and, um, you know, what opportunities or, or what needs there are at this stage and, and how we can, um, you know, make sure we're looking at that through the, you know, what we do now with that lens. Um, it goes back to that investing wisely that James mentioned earlier. Um, just any observations on that? And Mike, do you have any from, you know, in terms of the assets that you um, have? Yeah, well, certainly at one extreme, the, and I'm part of a public company, so the, the market, the investors are saying we need to have much more transparency about the way in which you are managing your climate-related risks, and you need to report on that. And you, uh, with, I think within three years, you will be mandated to quantify the impacts of all of that. So I think at one level, that's good because that creates um, the spotlight that's required. And then companies have to start to think through, like they do any one of their risks. You know, what is the risk that's there as a, an inherent level? How do I mitigate that down to an acceptable residual level? And, and what's the most effective way uh, to get there? So companies, I think, are very used to being adaptive. And I, I sometimes wonder why climate change gets put to the side. And we, you know, as business leaders, we spend a whole lot of time talking about risks. Uh, I think even if I wasn't selling the products that I do, I think climate change is one of the single biggest risks for any organization and it should be right in the, in the center of all your risk conversations and you should just treat it, dare I say it, just like any other risk. Mm. Uh, apply your skills to it, do the, do the methodologies, do the work and report on it and make yourself accountable for your progress. Mm. Yeah. And just, um, Kirsten, have you got anything to add? Because I was going to say a couple of things otherwise. No, you go, you go right. Oh, I was just thinking that it depends which sector you're in um, for adaptation, but uh, we know that the councils are trying to work out the impact of sea level rise in their communities and how they do their planning around that. 
storm events, uh, the rural sector, particularly around droughts and floods and, um, and growing food for the future. So there's a lot of, every sector is gonna have a slightly impacted um, thing around as we adapt to that changing climate, changing sea level, rise drier, warmer, new pests coming through, Mike, you mentioned earlier. Um, uh, new health diseases that we might have as well as pests for um, the food that we might grow. So every single uh, organization needs that twin strategy on climate mitigation, adaptation. I agree. I, I'd have to say when we first launched in 2018, you know, the majority of our business customers were really looking for a, a, a pretty picture to put on their annual report. And there was a lot of, you know, greenwashing and, and if I was being completely honest and transparent on it. Um, and then we, what we've seen now coming, uh, you know, and expanding into Auckland is when you talk to CEOs and you talk to directors of businesses, they're saying, actually, we want to walk the talk. We want to do this. So we are seeing that shift. And I guess um, what we want to see is, is uh, CEOs and boards, whilst there will be some uh, uh, immediate distractions with, with the pandemic, that they don't um, lose their focus on just the importance of their carbon accounting and uh, the long-term you know, risks with sustainability and, and climate change. Uh, um, Kirsten, um, a question has come through in terms of car sharing in more geographical uh, you know, spread areas, um, mm. the regions particularly. I just wondered mm. if, um, from your perspective, you've got any comments on that. Um, yes, well, that was um, part of our thought around creating another model, um, which is that exclusive car sharing model, because we had businesses in, in regions like Hamilton saying, look, we really want to have a pure electric car sharing model. Would, would you come? And for us, there's a lot of risk with uh, going into a city on our, our standard open car sharing model. So um, yes, we are looking at, at going into the regions this year on, on um, and Hamilton will be one of those, uh, working with specific business customers to deliver a shared model for their actual business. F fantastic, thank you. Rach, this was uh, one that's come in in terms of, um, you know, food waste to buy gas and the, um, you know, the relative priority of um, a, a low value approach, uh, potentially high value through composting. Just wondered if you've got any comments on, on that, you know, when, when is composting the answer and when is a more industrial process yeah. the answer? Man, that's such a tricky question. And I, um, I've heard the arguments on both sides for a long time. Uh, one of the challenges is that uh, some people are bloody good at composting um, in their systems. They're very good at it, they end up with great outcomes, but actually a lot of us are pretty terrible at composting. It's not a little bit like people who are good at gardening. Some are good and some just aren't. Um, so I can understand why you would centralize and, um, and try and use those more effective systems. But I actually think we need to have a dual approach. I don't think one solution is the way forward. Um, because people who are good at gardening or have enough land to do that um, need the compost because it improves the quality of your soil. Um, but then those of you uh, who, or those of us who don't or can't uh, compost, we need a system that means that it actually gets utilized because it's a valuable resource either for animal food or for um, biogas. So we should be doing both, I think. Absolutely. Um, uh, it's quite interesting to see the, the different uh, kind of approaches that different businesses are taking in terms of how they're supporting their people through this time. And obviously most are you know, do, supporting really well um, and looking after their people. Um, but, but perhaps not all. I mean, you know, uh, what opportunity, you know, thinking about um, when this is over, um, to what extent will the businesses that have kind of looked after their people well will benefit from, you know, doing that at this time as, as you know, they emerge out of this crisis? Uh, Mike, do you maybe want to start with that one? 
Yeah, I think that's certainly a focus for us at Z. Uh, it's it's uh, frankly, it's really easy to fire people. I mean, if you take the emotion out of it, they're just a number representing a, a salary or a cost. Uh, and these are the times where I think you can build, as I mentioned earlier, really strong relationships with your employees by actually backing them and getting them to back you. And, and what I'm certainly doing inside my firm, I'm we've been very transparent about the challenges we have. We're letting people know the size of the gap and we're empowering our people to make some really good choices. And you also have to be a chief executive. There's a boundary that says if we can't do all of these things that give us the benefit, then we have no choice but to go to um, where we are. And indeed, it's something as simple as uh, the government wage subsidy. But you know, I've, I've kind of taken that one to our people and said, hey, what do you think we should do there? Should we apply for it? And that's worth $4 million to a company like us, which would preserve sort of 40 jobs for a whole year um, if we were to take that up. Or should we be um, more noble than others and and not take it up? And there's reputation risk by taking it up. Um, and equally, yeah, we are losing tens of millions of dollars every month right now in, in our business. So you know, how do we manage that paradox? So I think this is a time actually to be open with your employees and get their thoughts. And ultimately, the boss still has to make the call, but it does give people the chance to have a say. And through that having a say, they get to better understand what the issues are and the challenge of that particular <coughs> Kirsten, Rach, do you have anything to add to that? No, I thought that was really well answered, Mike. 10 out of 10. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, I would like to add to that. I was sitting on the Small Business um, Council for a year, um, and what we learned was that actually some of the real challenges, with, particularly for small and medium-sized businesses, is that often they're started by people who are, like me, who are really passionate about what we do, and then we've had to learn. Um, management skills through that process um, and so there are businesses out there who aren't particularly flash at um, those real fundamental business skills so when a when a disruption hits they don't have the cash flow to see them through for very long at all um, so that two to three week window is um, seems to be quite a common um, thing that I'm hearing so we're losing businesses because of the way that they uh, haven't thought through these kind of disruptions. And I, admittedly, this one is a really shitty one and we didn't see it coming and it's come fast and the impact is big, but I think we can learn a lot more about how we manage businesses now. Um, to Mike's point, uh, you do your best, but sometimes you just can't maintain the same number of staff. Um, so then how do we set that next movement on as kindly as we can? Because we know right now we're letting people go into um, a really, really tough employment environment. Um, so I'm hoping that there is a much bigger investment in reskilling um, and helping. We know that people tend to go into training uh, at this time. So the universities hopefully will increase their income because the foreign students might not be there, but we could have more local students learning. But we, then we have to teach them the right school, skills. Um, because if we're teaching them old skills from an old uh, economy, that's not going to help us at all either. So we have to make sure that we've got the ability, the capability, and the partnerships in place so that we can reskill uh, New Zealanders. Okay, thanks, Rach. Um, we're very close to uh, time. I just, just for each of you, um, just 30 seconds if you can. You know, you've, you've kind of mentioned a lot already, but what would be the one thing? that you would say is the priority um, for businesses at this, at this time in terms of building a better future? Kirsten. Okay, um, my message would be, uh, as, as I've said already, be bold, um, look for smarter ways to shape your business and that will deliver um, carbon savings, but it will deliver other savings as well. So um, my big message would, would be bold uh, and don't um, lose that simplicity of, of what we're doing at the moment and use that to uh, go forward and, um, and make changes within your business. Great, Mike. Uh, in a word, diversity. What I mean by that is, and I've been around for a long time and I've seen more than one crisis in my working career, lots of experience right now is useful, but does not, there is no experience that gets you through this. 
So I think we need to have the diversity of experience matched with the diversity of, of people who have no idea about what this is, this is like. So I'd really encourage business leaders to be listening to those in their organization they don't normally listen to because the experience doesn't matter so much because we are in the space where we have never been before. Mm. Nice. And I would just build on that because I think right now you've got to listen not just to your staff, but also to the people that you do business with. Uh, and then add to that and think about what future generations need us to be doing now and thinking about the noises the planet's been signaling to us and then start thinking about what's the business meant to be doing now. Um, now's our, you know, um, and if you're thinking about theory you, we're at the bottom of this, uh, this moment where we get a little bit of window of time to actually imagine what we're going to be, but we need to do it quite quickly. We don't have stacks of time to work that out but now is the time to listen really hard to all the signals that are out there and make sure that whatever you're reshaping is going to be needed in the future and I'd say that's the most important thing. Wonderful great way to wrap up um, many thanks again um, Kirsten, Mike, Rach um, for the contribution really interesting um, so we will um, yeah, just add to, in terms of those key messages, I think the key message the minister said was, was for us as businesses to speak up and make sure we're um, advocating for the sort of positive change we think is important. Um, so yeah, again, thanks to everybody who's joined this morning. Um, I hope you found it interesting. Um, as I mentioned, we will be collating um, sort of notes and, and building what we think, building on what Rachel presented in terms of that list of nine imperatives. Um, we're keen to hear your, your views on those and your own views. Um, so the survey that we'll send out will give you that opportunity. So, so please, please take that opportunity. We're really keen to hear your views. Um, so yeah, just to close up, thanks again. Um, good luck out there, stay safe. Um, and final message is please support the SBN member businesses and those others who are doing good work at this time when you're making decisions about what products and services you buy. Um, thanks very much, Kaki Tiano. Thank you.